So, hello everybody and welcome to another Inside XRF webinar. Today we are going to have a deeper look into the application Slack and Filter Dust. My name is Susan Aschenbrenner and um, I will show you some examples on why Slacks and Filter Dust are quite challenging samples. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the FNA section. And um, in the end of the webinar, if there's enough time, we might um, might answer some questions. Otherwise, um, I will answer them all via email um, after the webinar. So let's dive right into it. The ones uh, of you who have already seen some of the application um, webinars. Um, they will know this little flow chart. This uh, might seem a little bit familiar. So um, in our XIF analysis, we always start from, from having a sample. Then another very important part is sample preparation. We will do our analysis uh, using XIF uh, spectrometer, and then we will have a look in the results. So today we are talking about slacks and filter dusts. So let's have a look um, on what makes these samples uh, so special first. So we are talking about slacks and dusts and slacks and dusts are side or waste products um, in the metal industry. And what makes them so challenging is that there are differing amounts of reduced components in these slacks and dust. So you will have some metal parts um, in, in your slacks and also maybe reduced sulfur. And these reduced components uh, play an important role um, on uh, how you need to um, deal with these samples when it comes to analysis. Um, we will talk about this in depth later. So keep in mind, reduced components will be a main topic today. Why do we even want to um, analyze our slacks and dust? Um, first of all, we want to um, have some process control so we, um, we can uh, check uh, the slacks within the process. And also there might be further use of the slacks um, as uh, secondary uh, raw materials, for example, in the cement industry, in road construction or in agriculture. So also there, we would need to know what's inside our, our slacks. There are different kinds of slacks. There is a blast furnace slack. There are different steel mill slacks and there are non-ferrous metallurgical slacks. And there are also some more, um, some more slacks um, um, belonging to the steel mill slack sector, um, converter slack, electric arc furnace slack, stainless steel slack, and also some secondary metallurgical slacks. So you see, there's quite a broad range of sample that we have to deal with in this whole sector. And then we also have a look um, in filter dusts. Um, which uh, are coming from the gas cleaning. So this is the wrap up on why, why we want to analyze these samples and which samples we are talking about today. Coming back here, we will now have a look um, in sample preparation, how we can prepare these uh, slacks and filter dust. And uh, for the routine slack preparation, it's most of the time pressed pellets. So when you are like in your routine and, um, um, and, and you have to analyze slacks um, on a regular basis, um, it will be pressed pellets in most of the cases. But if your um, slacks show um, different, val different values outside of your routine that you are not expecting, fused beads might be a good idea we will look into this now in detail when this um, would be the when this would be the case. But for the routine um, itself, it's most of the time pressed pellets. 
But first, um, we need to make sure that the particle size of our sample is fine enough to do either of the preparations. Um, so grinding is a very important step for successful preparations. The particle size is very important um, because it will affect the trueness and it will also affect the reproducibility um, of your measurement results. And when we are looking um, on pressed pellets now in, in this uh, special case, um, it has some advantages um, uh, to, gr uh, grind the uh, to, uh, the, to grind the to um, grind the the slag to be a, become a very uh, fine powder. The first thing is powder and binder for for pressing the pellets can be mixed very well. The pressed pellet will then have the smoothest surface possible, which is very good for our measurement afterwards. And we will also have less particle size effects. What are particle size effects? Um, maybe a, a short reminder. When we are using XRF, um, we are having something called analysis depth. Um, so what is happening is that we are um, that we are trying to analyze the sample, but the fluorescence radiation coming out of our sample will only come from a certain depth of the sample. So when you are having quite um, quite uh, big particles there, you might analyze only one layer of particles. And it's very um, common that then this layer will not be representative for the whole sample. But the finer your, um, your powder is, the, um, the more representative it will be for the whole sample in this pressed pellet. So keep in mind, fine powder for pressed pellet will result in, in better results. How uh, can a pressed pellet be prepared? Um, there are some uh, different kinds of presses. Um, our press uh, from Fluxana, they look like this. You have automatic presses where you can basically just uh, press a button and the press will do everything by itself. Um, and you also have manual presses um, so that you still need some uh, muscle work to um, to get um, the pressed pellet here. But in the end, um, both of the different um, different uh, presses will uh, result in a pressed pellet. And in this case, powder is then pressed with a binder, and it's a very fast preparation. Why is this better than just preparing a loose powder? If you prepare a loose powder in a cup, um, first of all, you cannot use vacuum for your measurement. And also you will have a lot of air in between particles. Um, as soon as you have something like a pressed pellet, it's also easier for handling the sample in the end. And your, um, your sample will be compressed so that there's no air in between particles. And this leads to a, um, a better representation there. So how do we, um, do we prepare a pressed pellet in, um, in detail? You have your sample that was, um, um, that was grind, grind before, and you will have some kind of binder. In this case, um, it is Cereox, which is our wax binder. Um, these two components are mixed well and then pressed, and then you obtain the pressed pellet. So what you see is that this whole thing is quite easy to do, and it is fast. So now we could ask the question, um, why is this preparation as pressed pellet not ideal? We have... Um, we have ma made um, some effort to um, to get these nice uh, pressed pellets, but why is this not sometimes not enough? The reason is that you might get some surprising results in your measurements. Um, and to understand why this is happening, you have to see that we are looking at the samples in a very special way. 
because we are using XRF as a measurement method. And we can only see what XRF sees and XRF cannot see compounds. And now the thing that I said right in the beginning when we are, talk when we are talking about um, samples and what's special about uh, slag and dust samples um, is coming back. <laughs> Slags and dusts are normally not completely oxidic. And that means that we can have differing amounts of reduced components that can be metallic parts. Um, this can be a re reduced sulfur. And this is playing tricks on us because XRF cannot see it. So at some point it might happen that um, your, um, your um, uh, press palette gives uh, measurement results that do not really fit to your routine measurements. And as soon as you're somehow out of this routine and out of your calibration range there, and as soon as they are different from what you're measuring like on a daily basis in your routine, um, it might happen that they do not fit into your calibration anymore. And that um, the whole thing cannot be presented correctly due to the differing oxidation states and due to the reduced parts. And in this case, your measurement results will just not be true. What can we do to get better results there? Um, we can uh, prepare our sample as fused bead. To do this, there are um, different possibilities. Um, you can um, use an electric uh, muffle furnace automatic fusion machine or you can use a, a gas-driven automatic fusion machine. Um, you can also fuse uh, by hand, um, which is not really common anymore, but um, it's still possible. But um, the, um, the aim is always the same to, to get this kind of fused bead in which, um, and I will explain why this is later, all of your um, components are oxidized and then they are like all on the same level and they will always fit into the calibration there. So another advantage of uh, preparing um, as a fused bead is that you don't have any particle, uh, particle size effects. Um, this is because this, um, this fused bead um, is completely homogenized and um, your analyzed level, layer will always be a, a perfect representation of your whole sample. Um, in general, the sample is uh, fused into a bead using fusion flux, and we will have a look now how this works. So for completely oxidic samples, this is also quite easy. Um, similar to the um, to, to the pressed pellet, the fusion process takes longer and you need another machine. But in general, you mix the sample and you mix uh, some glass building material, which in most of the cases is a lithium borate. You homogenize it. Then you have your mixture for the fusion, everything together in a crucible, fusion, fused bead, and done. But in our case, we are talking about samples with metallic parts and metallic parts uh, can be uh, platinum poisons, um, which basically means that they are building an alloy with the platinum setting, um, uh, setting the temperature where the platinum melts the melting point down and um, destroying the crucibles during the, in the fusion process. So damaged crucible is not something that we want. So we need to oxidize our samples completely. But before we do this, we are again um, talking about grinding our samples. Again, this is, um, this is a topic that is important for our successful preparation. Why is this for fused beads? Um, you have better solubility or you are even just soluble uh, during fusion process um, when when the sample is fine enough and you also need a fine powder for um, for your oxidation process 
how does the oxidation work? There are actually two methods how to do it. Um, in this first method, um, you are taking a sample and the oxidizer, then you oxidize those two, then you have your oxidized sample. Another step, you mix your oxidized sample with the lithium borate, you fuse and uh, homogenize it, then it is poured and then you get the fused bead. So basically, um, it's this oxidizing step that is different from what I showed before. And then there is a second method um, how to um, how to oxidize um, the sample. Um, this is um, basically a one one step process. There you have sample and oxidizer and the lithium borate in one step. You first oxidize and then you fuse um, fuse the oxidized sample, pour it and get a fused bead. Um, how does this look like in reality? Um, you take your crucible and then first put the fusion flux into the crucible. Then you add um, your oxidizer in the sample. In this uh, case, uh, the oxidizer is strontium nitrate. And what is very important now is that you a layer the sample and the oxidizing agent on top of your fusion flux and the walls of the crucible must not be touched because when um, the um, oxidizing mixture touches the crucible walls we end up with the same problem as before um, that we will get damaged crucibles so this um, needs uh, a little bit of practice to to really put it in a good way that that it will not touch crucible walls and then um, this, um, this crucible is ready to go. And then you obviously also need a special fusion program to, um, to have this oxidation happening in a, a safe way. So what, what you're do basically doing is that you're setting an oxidation temperature, which is below the melting point of the borate and the sample. Um, you oxidize the whole thing and then you um, increase your temperature to a level where the borate and the sample become liquid. Then you homogenize it, then you pour it and cool it, and then you get the um, completely oxidized material in this fused bead. There are different oxidizing agents, and for slags, two of these oxidizing agents are, um, are common. Uh, one is ammonium nitrate and one is strontium nitrate. Um, the ammonium nitrate um, has the advantage that there are no spectral interferences um, in our XRF measurement because nothing that is here can be seen with our XRF. Um, but it's quite hard to handle because it's very hygroscopic. So this is not very fun to, to handle it. It's possible. It's not a problem if you, if you have um, if you have some uh, experience, but um, it, it's just not as nice as, for example, the strontium nitrate. This is way way nicer to use, way easier to use. Um, but if you are, for example, working with EDXRF. Um, this makes more sense because of the spectral interferences um, of the strontium in, in EDXIF. Um, so the ammonium nitrate is mostly used in ED um, in ED applications. The strontium nitrate, um, on the other hand, is very easy to use, and the strontium is uh, rarely an important analyte, so it mostly doesn't bother, except when you're using EDXIF. And it also doubles as a heavy absorber. So you are having it as in two roles, basically, there. So, so much about sample preparation. And now we will have a look um, into analysis and the results. So for analysis with XIF, you will need a calibration. 
um, the easiest way is to buy a ready-to-use calibration uh, set. Um, Fluxana offers a Slack set and then uh, the extension Slack Dust for if you want, also want to measure filter dusts. Um, and these are sets of used beads. Obviously, you can also just buy CRM material or have internal standards and set up an, a calibration by yourself. This will just be more work to do there. So it's just um, the decision you have to uh, have to make. Um, to show you how this can look like, um, this is what our Slack set looks like. We have 28 calibration standards. Three calibration standards are synthetic. I will explain in the next uh, slide what that means. And we have five validation standards. Um, sulfur cannot really be analyzed here because in the fused bead it will get lost. Um, it's um, the the reduced sulfur we cannot um, we cannot really um, keep keep that in a not random way. <laughs> so um, the sulfur cannot be analyzed with this um, with this application with this special application. So what is a synthetic standard and why do we need it? There are actually not so many top quality CRMs available and some we also need as validation samples because validation, you will see this is, is very important, especially when you are dealing with, um, with more complicated samples. Um, so what is done is um, we uh, weigh pure chemicals to reach a specific concentration. This is uh, quite a task um, um, to handle um, and, and, and to do this. Um, I guess this, uh, um, this already shows um, that, that it's quite complicated. So each of these small, small bits is um is a different uh, chemical that is then weighed in to to reach the specific concentration but the thing is that you get a high flexibility in choosing crms and uh, designing calibrations so especially like when you're um when when you need some uh, some very high concentration a very low concentration some concentration that is not in any crm but you need it to get um get the calibration um, done in, in a certain way or because you want to know that um, that um, you want to measure something that is a little bit rare or something like this. It makes sense to, to have this uh, freedom to, um, to design your calibration in a certain way without being um, stuck with the CRMs that are on the market. And now we talked a lot about snacks and now we could ask like, okay, what do dusts have to do with it? Um, the thing is that with this calibration, um, you can also measure dust samples. And this is a big advantage for the, for this, uh, for, uh, of this calibration that you can actually measure the slacks and the dusts in one calibration. Um, with the dust extension um, for um, for the slack uh, calibration set, this one is coming with uh, 11 uh, calibration standards. Five of um, those are synthetic. So you see that we need some more synthetic standards. Um, and for the filter dust samples, a higher dilution is necessary because we are having more metal and especially here the uh, the zinc. We have a lot more zinc here than in the slacks. Um, so um, these samples are weighed um, to half of the amount um, of the slack sample. So slack double weighing, um, and then half of it is, is for dust. And this also has to be considered in the calibration. But if this is done, then you have the big advantage that you have only one calibration for both. So what does that calibration look like or what can this calibration look like? Um, 
This is uh, the iron calibration um, as some uh, one main component in a calibration range of zero to seventy percent. And um, if you already saw some um, some other application um, webinars, um, you will see that um, that the scattering is a little bit wider than usual. You have a comparatively white scattering when compared to a very easy oxidic um, oxidic uh, application. And there's different reasons to that. Um, first of all, um, iron can be uh, abundant in different um, oxidation stages. And then there's different qualities of CRMs. And since slags are not like the very easy samples, um, the quality of CRM is also, yeah, it can differ uh, in between um, CRMs, um, especially when it comes to um, different oxidation sta uh, stages and how well this is described um, for the um, for the special CRM, and then. Um, sometimes there's also a problem of uh, homogeneity um, of these CIMs because um, of, uh, in, in general, there can be a problem of uh, homogeneity with these slack samples. So there's a lot of things to, uh, to keep in mind. This then also results in, um, in a wider range um, in, in your control chart. And there you have to um, see like how, how much range you can allow, how, how precise does your result has, have to be um, and which kinds of CRMs um, you want to use for your calibration. And then you also have to keep in mind that no matter what is happening with your main component, will also um, have a influence on uh, the minor um, or tra uh, minor and trace components um, of, of your sample. So um, this is um, just something to keep in mind. So in this case, we are having uh, magnesium as, um, as a minor component um, in a range between um, zero and, yeah, well, very high 21%. And um, yeah, also here we um, we will see in the measurement if um, if the um, if one component if the major component is is a little off or so minor and, and trace components um, will show the effect. Another control chart. So now we talked a lot about why slack samples are complicated and what we can do to get better results and what we will do in our routine if if we are completely off and um and and how we get a nice um nice results in the end um if we are dealing with a material that is um not so easy to analyze it's even more important to um uh, get yourself a grip to something that is true <laughs> And so proficiency tests uh, for labs that are analyzing slags are quite important. Since we in our Fluxana laboratory are also analyzing slags, uh, we know that um, there are not so many proficiency tests for slags around, um, but still um, it is important to um, to check with other labs or check with a certified reference material if there's no proficiency test uh, coming up um, to uh, to have a look um, if you are um, if your method is functioning um, or if you are off at some point just because it's not not the easiest sample that you can analyze. So, and now that we talked a lot about uh, slacks, I would still like to uh, take you on a small excursion to similar materials because this um, preparation as fused bead um, can also be used as base for analysis of similar materials. 
that are also containing reduced components in differing amounts. And this is something that is quite nice. So this, um, um, this preparation technique that I showed you before um, can also be used um, for, for other materials that, that are also having reduced components. For example, we see this a lot in the recycling industry. Um, when doing this and then analyzing um, these materials, um, it's still important to see the bigger picture there. Um, I would like to show you one example for that. Um, this is a, um, a proficiency test we did in the end of uh, 2021. And um, we used um, the, the, um, the preparation technique um, um, that, um, that I showed you before for this proficiency test. And we also um, gave this preparation technique as a handout to all of the participants um, as a, um, um, yeah, as a possibility uh, how to prepare um, this material. And what we see there in these results is that we have an immense error. So we are having 21% of, in this case, is nickel, and we um, have 1.5% uh, error. And um, this is due to uh, heterogeneities in the material. So um, always have a look on the bigger picture if you're using um, one, um, uh, one uh, preparation technique for other fields, because um, <laughs> something else can create major ch challenges uh, in your evaluation. And in this case, it was uh, in homogeneities. But still, it's a very nice thing that you can also use this uh, preparation technique for, for different fields. So let's uh, run through the summary. <laughs> um, First of all, we talked about that samples should be fine enough for the analysis. Pressed pellets are a great preparation um, technique for the routine. And as soon as it comes to exceptions from the routine samples, fuse beads might be a good idea since then you have no faults and this is due to measurements of reduced components. Then um, for the preparation of fused beads, you need oxidizing agents because otherwise you will have damaged crucibles because the metallic parts are platinum poisons. And then you need the oxidizer and the oxidizer is depending on the XRF device, the preparation. Um, and um, then you need different oxidizing agents, different amounts of this oxidizing agent. This has to be adjusted there. And for the fusion, you also need a fitting fusion program. How do I come up with a calibration? The uh, very effective solution is to have a ready to use calibration uh, set with the CRMs and the synthetic standards. But obviously you can also buy CRMs, have your um, internal uh, standards, have your uh, samples that you have very nice um, analysis of and, and calibrate yourself. This is also possible in any case controlling the method for samples that are not like the very easy one is even more important. So participating in proficiency tests is important. Uh, CRM validation samples um, from good, um, gr good CRM manufacturers um, are important. And then you're ready to go and you will have a nice method to go with. All right. So thank you for your attention. Next month, there will be another applications uh, webinar on geological samples. So maybe if you're interested in this, um, join us again. <laughs> um, I would like to um, to answer your um, your questions via email. So please feel free to still 
fill the Q&A section with a lot of questions. I will answer them all via mail. If you come up with more questions um, 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 after the webinar or in a few days when you um, when you had the time to rethink about this, please uh, feel free to always send questions. Uh, you can also send them to this info at fluxana.com email. Um, they will reach me, no worries. And yeah, I wish you a very nice day.